once again, welcome to the study. You may have noticed that uh, we are going to start a new series today. And uh, we will uh, well, get into it. We'll get into the intro today and then get into the beat of it uh, as we go along. Uh, let's request Praveen to start off the whole thing by uh, a prayer for our a blessing on our time together. Thanks, Father in heaven, we are so thankful to you, Lord, for giving us another opportunity to study your word. I, we ask for your leading and guidance as we spend this hour in the meditation of your word and uh, in uh, discussions of God. You speak to us, especially we want to hear your voice through your servant as he teaches us. And uh, you be the moderator of our discussions. May your spirit inspire us through the word and through the discussions, O oh Lord. Our words may be encouraging and uh, uh, help our members to edify and equip and the time we spend in fellowship with our members and in your presence, O oh Lord. May be a time that brings forth fruit which you desire in our lives, O oh God. We submit this time our minds and hearts asking for your revelation and illumination so that, we, that you may open our hearts and we may be able to receive. And ultimately, your name be exalted. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, well, uh, uh, today we are going to start a series which I have titled as Spiritual Discipline for Spiritual Growth. Uh, now I have, uh, we have a series of studies on our GCI website, and so I have basically taken uh, the structure from there. But I will be bringing in uh, some discussions, even from uh, outside of our fellowship. You know, uh, authors, uh, theologians who have uh, have had a, you know, a discussion on this. But let me, uh, today what we will do is just, I'm going to introduce the, uh, the, the concept of spiritual discipline. And uh, we will get into each of those disciplines as we go along. But before we get into the actual, um, you know, what actually it means, what would spiritual disciplines mean? There is a dilemma that, uh, you know, Christians... Uh, regularly struggle with and and that is what should Christians do in their faith or with their faith right with their discipleship how do we conduct ourselves and of course this was also something we discussed some time back and we turned it into a booklet uh, you know um, oh uh, saved what next, right? Is that right, Praveen? Am, am I getting the title right? Yeah. Saved what next? You know, what do we do? And the reason we, we I think we struggle is for us in the Christian faith, uh, there are, I know there are certain prescriptions in the scriptures, but people are, so, I mean, Christians are so, what do you say, um, divided over what is it that actually must entail in terms of our behavior and what do we do and all of that. You know, many other faiths have very some of them can be very ritualistic. You do certain rituals and you are fine. You know, there's nothing else uh, that you need to bother about. But we Christians, we are constantly looking at our temperature and, uh, you know, am I, am I in the right path? And am I doing okay? Uh, you know, is my salvation secure? And so we are constantly wondering whether uh, all my activities are, you know, pleasing in the eyes of God. So uh, that is the, that is something that I think we, be, we discuss quite often. I want to make a contrast between two concepts, and that is activity versus passivity. Right. Uh, uh, some believe uh, in the Christian faith. Some believe that 
we need to be extremely active, right? Activity is, the, is what uh, defines the Christian, is the hallmark of a disciple of Jesus, various activities, right? And well, daily, you know, routines like daily Bible study, uh, prayer, and then they will allocate timings for that. Uh, they want to feel that they have done adequate amount of study and, and, and prayer. And then, of course, there is meditation that goes along with it. Did you spend enough time in meditating? And then you can add various things to the list, right? So these kinds of activities is something that uh, uh, Christians constantly, you know, are thinking about. And some of them will feel guilty if they missed it. Oh, I missed my Bible study today. Or some people will make them feel guilty. Did you pray today? <laughs> and so, so this kind of activity is something that we Christians keep thinking about. And interestingly enough, some people take it to an extreme. And of course, we have the famous Pharisaical group, you know, the Pharisees, who take it to the extreme where they want to put in their time, like we say, put in your time on a daily basis in study and prayer and meditation. And of course, the Pharisees like to be seen doing that. So they like to do it to be seen. And that is where we call legalistic, you know, they become legalistic. Uh, uh, so activity oriented Christianity can sometimes become legalistic. Then there is on the other hand, on the other spectrum, uh, the passivity. There are those who believe that, uh, well, Christ has done it all. You know, salvation is not of works. Uh, there is hence nothing for us to do to contribute to salvation. Uh, and so all we need to do is just wait. Wait till, you know, the, wait on the Lord, wait on the second coming. Uh, and as uh, you know, human beings always do. They get, they take it to the extreme where, you know, uh, they don't necessarily have a structured Christian life. They don't subscribe to that. And uh, thus they can become what we normally call is nominal Christians. Right? So on the one extreme, you have legalistic Christians. On the other extreme, we have nominal Christians who will hardly be involved in any of these activities that, uh, uh, that we just spoke about. And of course, of course, there are lots of people who, you know, uh, also talk about imitating Christ. Uh, Christ fasted, Christ prayed, Christ uh, went into solitude, Christ suffered. And so some people, of course, believe that, well, if Christ suffered, I must also suffer. And so they self-inflict suffering upon themselves. So these are the various, uh, what do you say, mindsets people bring to the faith. So I just wanted to mention that because, uh, you know, uh, as we get into the subject, I think I hope that we can lay a foundation uh, to be able to understand where we are coming from. So uh, where do we draw the line? Should we be active? Should we be passive? And both are, in one sense, correct. There has to be certain activity, but then also we have to understand, uh, you know, a, a, a passivity. Now, activity, we believe faith without works is dead. So there has to be some works involved in the, uh, in the living out of our Christian faith. But on the other hand, I think we must understand passivity from in the right context. When we understand passivity in the right context, uh, we recognize that activity does not save us, right? Uh, we have to allow God to work in us. So we are, uh, we are passive in the sense that we are allowing the Holy Spirit to work in us. So there is, uh, you know, both of them can be understood from a particular context and can be right. The question is, where do we find the right balance, you know, uh, a right balance for our personal lives? You know, each one of us can be a little different the way we approach all of this. But where do we find the balance in our own personal lives? 
whether it is activity or in passivity, there is no doubts about the fact that we must be engaged. And that is what I would like to call as the right balance. There has to be an engagement. Christianity cannot be uh, a non-engaged, you know, nam ke vaste fate. There has to be an engagement. All right. Um, right. Uh, there has to be a connection, a union. Uh, we have to be led of the spirit, inspired in the love of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And so, uh, having said that, what is the essence of the Christian of the Christ, of the Christian life? Uh, in our in our you know specific individual situations. What is the essence of the Christian faith and how is it played out in each one of our lives? And that is where now I move to uh, just talking, just briefly mention about the essence of Christianity and then get into the question, what are spiritual disciplines? I believe that uh, one of the essence of Christianity uh, is the fact that we must grow as a Christian. We talk about transformation, don't we? Uh, we, a lot of uh, pious Christians talked about, talk about sanctification. How are these things accomplished? How do we grow in, a, in, a, in our Christian faith? How do we allow ourselves to become, uh, to transform, right? Do we engage or do we participate in sanctification or, or is sanctification entirely of the Holy Spirit? Yes, it is. But is there a participation? And so this is where the essence of Christianity in terms of the lifestyle begins to unfold for us. I think we need to recognize that we are all on a journey. And the Apostle Paul is very, very eloquent when he talks about how we are on a journey, right? A journey of becoming, right? We are, yes, we are, we, we, uh, uh, we are in Christ, but we are also growing in Christ. We, there is a becoming aspect of the Christian faith. So in that sense, Christianity is a dynamic faith, right? Uh, dynamic in, its, in the activity that we are involved in, and dynamic in the passivity. Sometimes there is a passivity we embrace where we allow God to be God, as I think uh, has been coming out very clearly in our sermons recently, right? Especially with what we are dealing in terms of the struggles we are facing at this moment. We allow God to be God. If I can bring this essence of Christianity from another angle, Christianity is relational rather than ritualistic, right? Now, uh, I should say it is more relational than ritualistic. There is a, there is a ritual or a ritualistic aspect of it. For example, if we are doing daily Bible study, daily prayer, we are following a, rit a ritualistic pattern, and that's perfectly all right. But on the other hand, we are also recognizing that there is a relational aspect of it. Why do we engage in a ritual? So as to fulfill the relational, the relationality of our faith, right? And it is in this context, I believe we must understand the subject of spiritual discipline. So what do we, when, when I mention spiritual discipline, what I basically mean is all the things that we do, you know, it can start with Bible study, it can you know, go to prayer, it can go to meditation, it can go to solitude, it can go to fasting, uh, it can go to serving. Uh, and we will look at a list as, uh, you know, towards a little towards the end. All right. Um, so what uh, I am hoping that you are catching from what we have discussed so far is that uh, there is a purpose to spiritual disciplines. Uh, the spiritual discipline is not an end in itself, right? 
it is an end to a means, or rather I should say the other way, it, it's a means to an end, right? We use spiritual discipline, we engage in spiritual discipline so that we accomplish something. And that is, I think, uh, the uh, essence of what we will discuss as we go along. So the essence of the Christian life, the Christian faith, is not spiritual disciplines by itself. You know, the essence of Christianity is not just praying. It's not just Bible study. It's not just meditating or whatever you, uh, uh, whatever, you know, uh, nomenclature you use. But we do engage in study and prayer and fasting and whatever to develop in, in, in us what we call is spiritual maturity, right? What is the use of praying when we don't really, you know, uh, allow that prayer to transform ourselves? I think I mentioned this uh, this past Sunday that prayer changes us, not changing, does not change God. You know, God in his love towards us, in his commitment towards us, never change, changes. But we change as we pray. And so that, that's the question I want to ask, right? And for example, people would rather see a patient Christian instead of a praying Christian. Right? I hope you can. I'm catching this, uh, uh, the series of uh, captions that I'm, I'm using, right? People would rather see a sacrificing Christian instead of a studying Christian. People would rather see a forgiving Christian instead of just a fasting Christian. And people would rather see a mediating Christian rather than just a meditating Christian. People would rather see a confessing Christian rather than a condemning Christian. I hope you like those, uh, those uh, you know, combination of words. You know, Baba Bolo Thoro. I'm just joking. Huh? Um, so I was just trying to see how I can use the rhyme these words. Uh, uh, so, you know, uh, what I'm basically trying to say is, uh, you know, praying and studying and uh, uh, meditating. Uh, and, uh, you know, all of these things are okay. But the question is, is that leading us to becoming more of a forgiving Christian, you know, a loving Christian, a sacrificing Christian, a serving Christian? That is the crux of the point when we talk about spiritual disciplines. So don't get stuck with just spiritual disciplines. You know, that you think that you're okay if I've been praying every day, but then you go and, you know, chew out your employee or chew out your, you know, your uh, colleague uh, and you have a relational, uh, you have a fight at home every day. Uh, what, how does that make us good Christians, even though we are praying and studying and all of that, but we behave in such a rotten manner? So having said that, what are spiritual disciplines? Okay, now let me just get into uh, the subject proper. Spiritual disciplines can be described as behaviors that facilitate spiritual growth. So once again, remember, it's a means to an end. Spiritual discipline does not stop with uh, just the discipline by itself. They are behaviors that facilitate spiritual growth. You see, God's purpose is, God's purpose for us is so that we develop a loving relationship with each other and, of course, with him. And it is in our relationship with him that we are able to then have a relationship with one another. So once again, the relational angle comes out loud and clear. One powerful way to know our Lord better is through spiritual disciplines. It is that engagement in prayer and study and all of those lists of things that you will bring in. Uh, that we are connected to the life, the real life, the life of God. And so through that, we are able to understand God better. Okay. 
So the process of spiritual growth and development begins to take place when a person encounters God, right? And we encounter God through and can be through these spiritual disciplines. And God then creates a new level of consciousness or awareness in us. These spiritual disciplines are meant to help us, uh, you know, increase our consciousness of God, our awareness of God. So that simply put our spiritual disciplines. But what is it not? I think to make that contrast will perhaps uh, help us understand it better. Spiritual disciplines are not works that save us. All right. Or maybe I put it another way. They are not laws to obey. Spiritual disciplines are not laws that we are supposed to be obeying. Like I said earlier, they are means to an end for, for example, spiritual maturity or growth. Spiritual disciplines is not a sin. It is not a sin to neglect them. But it is not wise to ignore them. And I'm using a quotation from uh, a theologian, uh, a late theologian. Uh, his name is Dallas Willard. Uh, and uh, two names that come very uh, frequently when we talk about spiritual disciplines is this person, Dallas Willard and Richard Foster. And both of them were connected with GCI. And I think they have done lectures for us in the past. Dallas Willard, of course, passed away uh, several years ago. Richard Foster is uh, in his late 70s now. But these two have discussed this subject quite well. And I'm using Dallas Willard's uh, quotation where he says, it is not a sin to neglect them, but it is not wise to ignore them. And so in that respect, we need to recognize that we indeed live, we need to realize we live in, the, in, in grace and by grace. Right? Uh, and God motivates us then in this grace to be engaged through these spiritual disciplines with him and with one another. Let me move now to uh, another aspect. Did Jesus regularly participate in such disciplines? Did Jesus, you know, have spiritual disciplines? Well, let me just quickly go through a list. Uh, did he pray? <laughs> All right. Uh, at least 25 times in the Gospels, we read Jesus praying. Um, and according to Luke 5, 16, Jesus prayed often by himself. Right. Uh, so it was a habit for Jesus to pray. So prayer is something Jesus made part of his lifestyle, part of his, you, you could say, a daily routine. Did Jesus fast? And obviously the, the answer is yes. Even on the onset of his public ministry, Jesus took a 40 days fast in the wilderness. While it made his body weak, uh, his spirit grew stronger. And so perhaps there is a, uh, a spiritual benefit when it comes to fasting done, of course, in, in the, with the right intention, in the right manner, and in the right way. And of course, this is not something very popular with most of us. Fasting is not uh, an easy discipline, you know, to do on a regular basis. What about public worship? Worship is a discipline. This is a spiritual discipline. Well, in G with Jesus, as far as Jesus is concerned, Luke 4.16 tells us that on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue as was his custom. So Jesus made it a custom to be involved in public worship, to be joining people in worship. Now, of course, there were times when he was probably moving on, traveling, but on a regular basis, I'm sure he uh, was involved with public worship. Bible reading, of course, he's the very author of it, but, uh, but he did read scripture, didn't he? Uh, studying scripture was, I think, in one sense, an important part of Jesus' life. By the age of 12, he was an expert in the scriptures. Uh, he was biblically literate um, and uh, was teaching scripture. He quoted the Old Testament, you know on so many occasions. So he was biblically literate. So 
that discipline of being biblical literate is something that I think Christians need to be aware of. We uh, have to be biblically literate. Or it's good to be biblically literate. May not be a sin not to be, but uh, good to be so. How about, uh, I'm going to the fifth one, solitude and silence. Uh, did Jesus engage in the discipline of solitude and silence? And interestingly enough, this is not something that we speak of very often. But this is a discipline that, uh, you know, some Christians especially engage in quite often. And I think uh, Jesus Christ did that. Uh, he regularly ministered in front of large crowds, obviously, but he also made it a habit of getting away from time to time, as it says in Luke chapter 5. In fact, he even encouraged his disciples to get away to a quiet place and rest, right? Uh, and we will talk about when we come to that particular discipline, we will talk a little bit more about that. But solitude and silence is an interesting discipline, which I, I think in a busy world like ours, it's a tremendous challenge. We just can't uh, be away from the busyness of life, but uh, it's very important for us to get into that, uh, into, uh, practice that to some extent. Service, that's a discipline. Some people dedicate their lives to service. Uh, you know, you, we can uh, very, you know, quickly Recall so many, and the first name that comes to my mind is Mother Teresa. She dedicated her life to a particular service. Uh, and that was a discipline that she, you know, mastered in one sense quite well and was an expert in it. Well, did Jesus provide service? Obviously, he did. Jesus said his goal in coming to earth was not to be served, but to serve others. And of course, ultimate, the ultimate service he provided was to give his life for the you know, for the world. And so service can be a way of, you know, uh, practicing a particular spiritual discipline. Meditation, something that, you know, many times we tend to get a little confused with. Uh, but Jesus said, uh, sorry, um, uh, uh, the, there are no particular scriptures I'm talking about Jesus meditating as such, but the scriptures does talk about meditation, right? Uh, if you read the Psalms, um, there are many references to the practice of meditation, the meditation on God's word, and uh, uh, perhaps uh, meditation on, uh, you know, even uh, nature by itself to, to look up into the sky and to recognize the handiwork of God is a type of meditation. All right. So I think we can see very clearly that, uh, uh, Jesus was involved with, uh, you know, these spiritual disciplines. So, having what with what I have said, I hope you recognize that the, our focus of study, the reason we are studying spiritual disciplines, is specifically to to understand how it helps us to grow spiritually. I am not going to talk about the spiritual discipline and explain it, you know, the way we normally do. But I want to uh, uh, zero in on if you are doing prayer, how does it help you, right? So how does it help you grow? And so that is the, that is the exercise I am going to indulge in as we take this series forward. I'm not sure, quite sure at how many uh, sessions we'll do, but we'll, 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 we'll at least do three or four uh, to complete the series. So what are these spiritual disciplines that we will probably discuss? And I'm going to the list that is provided uh, by our, uh, our website. I'm going to share my screen at this moment. Uh, right. Just to help you recognize uh, what we will discuss. Okay, let me just quickly go down to yes, all right. I'm presuming that is uh, big enough, large enough for you to be able to see. I'll probably just zero in a little bit more. Is that okay, Praveen? You better zo zoom in a little more first. Zoom in a little bit more. Okay. Is that all right? Yes. You okay. Swipe the uh, slide bar towards your right. And, uh, okay. Let me just see if I can do that. Yes. Is that all right? Yes. Yeah, it is going off my screen. So, 
All right, so if you notice there on the screen, focus of our study, how do these disciplines help us to grow spiritually? That is what we, are, what we should be uh, uh, focusing on. So what are the spiritual disciplines we will discuss? Prayer. You know, if you see on the screen, prayer, that is God meets us where we are. Second is silence and solitude. A way to keep us alert to the uh, presence just get my notes here. Uh, a way to keep us alert to the presence of God, right? Silence and solitude. As, and uh, the, the, the explanation there is to help us recognize what it is supposed to accomplish. When you engage in this, in this kind of a discipline, what it is supposed to accomplish, okay? The third one is study, that is Bible study. Engaging ourselves with the written and spoken word of God, right? Fasting which is spiritually in spiritual intensity and intercession by seeking his will, right? Uh, meditation, listening, sensing, and heeding the life and light of Jesus Christ, all right? Uh, submission, the ultimate act of submission, Jesus' death on the cross. You know, something I never realized, submission could be a, a spiritual discipline, but uh, this list has the word submission. Maybe we'll discuss that when we come to it uh, down the line. Service, we already spoke about service. The spirit of service reveals in part the individual's heart and life, right? Guidance is a spiritual discipline, hearing God's voice and obeying him. Confession, acknowledging our sins and depending on God for his mercy, right? That can be uh, uh, termed as a spiritual discipline. Worship is something that we are all very familiar with. We, I'm sure all of us engage in it on a regular basis. Worship our lives as living sacrifices. Worship is a lifestyle. Celebration is also a spiritual discipline. Enjoying and celebrating the true joy that comes from God. And finally, whole life stewardship, a lifelong process as stewards of his possessions how well we are a steward of the possessions we have can be termed as a spiritual, uh, a spiritual discipline. Okay, so that is where I uh, want to leave it. Uh, and, uh, and actually, I, you know, uh, in, this, in this series of studies, I have some questions for discussions, if you notice down on the, on the uh, screen. But before we come to that, uh, I just want to, uh, clear any doubts that you might have. Uh, did I am I uh, did I make it clear enough for you to recognize what we are discussing, what spiritual discipline means? Uh, so if you have any comments or questions to make, let's take them first. And I'm presuming we should have enough time to get back to the questions for discussion. Yes, Suryamurthy, go ahead. Uh, you said, uh, where do we pray? What is the end of prayer? I just want to tell my experience. It is never myself starting the prayer. The moment you wake up every day in the morning, there are a hundred problems. So the hundred problems forced me to go to God, to pray. So that way God intends that we pray and have a good relationship with God. So it starts, yeah, the prayer habit is started by God, not from our side. Okay. All right. Thank you, Suramurthy. I think uh, what you're saying is, uh, is true to all of those disciplines. It is God who inspires us into every one of those. But of course, you specifically focused on prayer, which we will come to next week. Obviously, I'm not dealing with it. But we will discuss that a little bit more uh, thoroughly in terms of what it is supposed to accomplish in our lives. So prayer should not be a mechanical reaction from us. Uh, it should not just remain ritualistic like it is for so many. And some people will say, 
you know that uh, unless you pray for 30 minutes a day or three times a day or on your knees or with your arms raised see these are all the, me the me mechanics of prayer but that is not something that uh, you know uh, we are going to discuss we want to say we want to see what god intended and like you rightly said Surimurti, that uh, we have problems uh, I'm surprised uh, at your retired age, you have hundreds of problems as you wake up. <laughs> but uh, uh, yes, we all have problems. And, uh, and certainly that, that drives us to God. And, uh, uh, and uh, you know, and that is one way for us to connect with God regularly. Thank you for your thought. Any other, any other questions? Or, yes, Bertie, go ahead. Uh, unmute yourself, Bertie. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, we, we, we passed through a history where we were uh, taught uh, some of the disciplines like festivals and tithing and, uh, uh, you know, uh, the Sabbath and etc., uh, which was quite helpful to us in a way that uh, connected us and regularly gave us uh, an opportunity to, you know, to, uh, to check our faith and, you know, to grow in the faith. And uh, it has benefited us now. Now, these things, the scripture says, the, uh, you know, the examples in the past, in the old, referring to the Old Testament, uh, was that, that we could take comfort and, uh, and have hope. And now, while uh, it, it's obvious that uh, uh, while the law was an embodiment of uh, truth and godliness, uh, without the Holy Spirit, uh, they could not observe uh, that body of laws, etc. But God uh, in Christ has uh, taken care of it, and we are now the recipients and blessings of the Spirit, which enables us to, you know, have His laws written on our hearts. And we, and all that you're mentioning, will really help us. But what I was, my point is, those festivals and Sabbath, though not mandated to us in the New Testament uh, 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 New Testament, and uh, where the laws are written on the heart, we have Christ, we, 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 uh, we go by the law of love and believing the sovereignty of God, of Jesus Christ. But those things, uh, looking, uh, no, taking a, just a look at the past, those things really, uh, I enjoyed it. You know, <laughs> you know observe festivals and uh, the Sabbath, although... <laughs> Please don't mistake me that I'm mandating it or telling you that uh, that we have to observe it. But it was a good pointer and a regular pointer where we had uh, something that connected us and uh, helped us to walk in, in the walk in the faith and the truth and even have joy in the observance of it. Thank you, Bertie. Uh, perhaps what you are saying is maybe we can uh, classify that as obedience, the spiritual discipline of obedience, right? And we yeah. believe that we needed to obey certain, yeah. uh, you know, certain whatever laws or however you call it. Uh, but of course, <laughs> what happened is, uh, you know, those uh, laws became so large to us that uh, we some, somehow couldn't see beyond it. And of course, I'm looking at Mr. Rao, he's looking at, he's his, his look is like daggers at me. <laughs> we have had several discussions on this about obedience and law and all that stuff and how, what laws we obey. But I think the spiritual discipline of obedience is very much true. But the question is, what is it that we obey? And like you rightly said, uh, uh, you know, tithing, Sabbath keeping, uh, these are all very good disciplines. And, uh, you know, and but we have to make a very clear distinction between what is mandated and what is not. Okay. Anyway, thanks for uh, reminding us of the past. <laughs> right. Any, any clarifications you might need? Otherwise, I'll quickly go to the... Uh, I have two questions for discussion. Right. Any thoughts? Okay. Think about it. And while we do that, let me quickly go to the back to the uh, questions for discussion. Um, notice the first one. Let's discuss the first one. Let me see what thoughts you have. The first one is how to make sure that spiritual disciplines does not become either legalistic 
or make us nominal, right? You remember I mentioned, I, I made a distinction between activity and passivity. Uh, and uh, we have to be careful that we don't go to extremes uh, and where we tend to become legalistic or we don't care for it at all, where we just make it a, a nominal uh, perspective, you know, or look at it very nominally. And that I think also is not correct. So would you like to share any thoughts on this, how to make sure that spiritual disciplines does not become either legalistic or on the other hand, make us nominal, okay? I'm going to stop sharing. I, I, I hope you can remember the question because I'd like to see all of you. Otherwise uh, I can see only part of you, you know, in my, uh, when I share my screen. Any thoughts you'd like to add to what we already discussed? Bertram, go ahead. Uh, I would uh, like to uh, say that uh, uh, as we have a relational, uh, uh, in the relational aspect, uh, uh, which is uh, the reality in our Christian lives with the uh, Lord, with the Lord Jesus Christ, I believe if that relationship is right and uh, that we are honest with ourselves and sincere and simple about it, uh, Mr. Zakara, I feel there is an answer to our prayer every time. Okay. All right. It's, I mean, our, our prayers, our prayers are, uh, we can be sure our prayers are reaching the Lord and the Lord will in time, uh, as Mr. Armstrong used to say, it answers either no or it is delayed or it's immediate, you know. So, but we should know that we can, we are praying to the living God, our Lord, in a right relationship that we are in and that we can be sure of his answer. And many times it's good and right for us. And we are, many times it surprises us. Many times it surprised me personally. And okay. I'm sure others could say the same. Okay. Thank you, Bertie. What you're really saying is that, you know, uh, prayer is a very important thing. We do get an answer. And, uh, uh, but we want to, once again, the question is, uh, how do we make sure it does not become legalistic? Like, for example, uh, I'll come to you, Anil. Uh, uh, for example, was our past, the previous way of maybe keeping the Sabbath or tithing or the uh, laws of uh, unclean, uh, clean and unclean meats, did it become legalistic for us? See, Anil, you have a thought? Yeah, I think in a way it did become legalistic we were paying so much attention to that and uh, we even went to the extent of, you know, saying if we don't observe this, something terrible will happen to us. So we need to do that. That was the first point. But yeah, regarding how we ensure that it doesn't become a ritual and uh, that first question. Yes. Uh, yeah. Of course, it's, it's again a matter of the heart. Our, our heart should be in the right place. Uh, sincerely seeking uh, God, seeking Jesus Christ. But I think more importantly, uh, we need to ask God to give us that ability that to, not to make it a ritual and so on. Right. So he is the one and he will guide us and he will give us that enthusiasm and, and ability not to go into a rut kind of thing. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I think that's a good point. Uh, uh, you know, depending and trusting the, the Holy Spirit to yeah. make sure that we don't lose our balance. You know, we have, we have a right engagement in prayer, but we don't go overboard and, uh, you know, uh, uh, feel that we are champions just because we prayed half an hour a day. <laughs> right. Any, th any other thoughts? Right. Uh, yeah, Shanti, go ahead. Yeah. Um, I was thinking there are, there are, of course, there are, many ways but one of them could, would also be holding ourselves accountable in love and one another it's uh, like when we say it, for example communion examine yourselves it's a good time to not only do it at communion time but also normally to examine ourselves to assess uh, ourselves to see are we faltering are we making this just namesake or as a legally, you know, Sunday ana hai to Sunday ana hai. Ganti bajana hai to ganti bajana hai. You know, yes. are we making it like that? Or is our heart in the right place? We're doing it because we love the Lord and because the Lord first loved us. One. 
second thing is uh, also accountability partners with our trusted mentors you know people that we hold in our high esteem like we were talking about ones who are discerning enough who can correct us if need be in the cs um uh, to hold each other in love not because i you have sinned not like that but in love who can uh, tell us you know maybe on this thing i have seen you uh, you know struggling with this is there any help that i can i can give you or uh, i would like help in this scenario because um and and maybe add a third one so that it won't become nominal and legalistic is 1 timothy 4 7 i'll start with 1 timothy 4 7 it says be quick to abstain from senseless traditions and legends but instead be engaged in the training of truth that brings righteousness and of course it goes on to say for an aid godly training is much more valuable and so spiritual training is much more valuable in this life and for the life to come but it's important that we don't just follow senseless traditions we keep asking answers what i mean even if people tell us you have to do this you do you do that and you know lots of things come up like this right you have to do this you know? so it's good to ask ourselves in the training of truth is this valid is this scriptural is this help going to help me draw closer to the lord or am i drawing closer to tradition and fable so assessing like that oneself in love and one another in with men, with our mentors and and trusted ones okay. is a good way of keeping it factual and truthful yes thank you uh, shanti pravin i'll just come to you i i've seen the raised hand uh, i just wanted to mention i think uh, uh, the two points you mentioned are very interesting ashanti the first one is uh making sure that that our heart is in it right i mean so whatever you do uh whatever ritual or spiritual discipline you're engaged in your heart must be in it and i think to that extent i would say that in the in the past wcg era uh we had a heart in all that we did and i think to that extent we uh Uh, that that's wonderful and nobody can judge us for that we didn't do it uh, you know out for for show we did it because we believed in it so our heart was in it secondly i think you this point about accountability is also good i think people should recognize the uh, that they need to be accountable because sometimes people are become so christian so pious that they don't mind starving their family and doing all these other things practicing spiritual disciplines and yet the family is starved that is i think uh, so unfortunate and some christians get into that you know uh, they are so pious to not miss uh, certain spiritual disciplines that they will uh, you know not, not do things on time or they will miss out on spending time with their spouses or with their family Uh, i think that is very important and 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 others can point that out being accountable to others yeah thanks for those two thoughts pravin you had a thought yeah what i share maybe may sound a little different from what we uh, what we discussed till now and uh, the question we have is one of the toughest questions to uh, answer uh, first i would like to give a definition which was uh, given by a, a pastor in usa Uh, for legalism what legalism is we need to realize what it is uh, then i would like to speak about uh, the other two aspects about legalism as well as uh, becoming uh, very uh, nominal like kind of things so the definition given for legalism is legalism is a system of living in which we try to make spiritual progress or gain god's blessings based on what we do let me repeat again legalism is a system of living in which we try to make spiritual progress or gain god's blessings based on what we do so it speaks about our intentions in following our disciplines if our intention is to gain god's blessings or <clears throat> yeah uh or uh, to satisfy some or to to approve to get approval from god or any of these then it becomes legalism in terms of our intentions so second thing i would like to remind or uh, remind all of you all of us is this this struggle especially 
becoming legalistic or becoming nominal is a lifetime issue. It is not just uh, we got an idea, so we practice it and we can get succeeded. It is not this. This is a continuous battle that we are going to fight throughout our lives. It is a battle between the spirit and the flesh. Apostle Paul mentioned the same thing in Romans chapter 7, where uh, you know he explains about uh, how he is becoming legalistic and how he is becoming uh, he is going into a sin. Both things he explains and he says one particular uh, question uh, and that is very interesting. That is, who shall save me from this? He doesn't ask the question, what shall save me? What is going to save me? What should I practice? He asks the question, who is going to save me? Then comes the liberating chapter of Romans 8. And uh, then he speaks about the freedom that Christ gives us and uh, the comfort that he has in Christ Jesus. So uh, the struggle we have, any practice you take, our human flesh within a within few days, we have a tendency to make it either legalistic or we take it for granted and uh, we become so nominal in that. So it is a continuous practice, continuous problem we are going to face. No matter how wise uh, we bring the disciplines and rules and regulations we try to put for ourselves, it is within our flesh and we have to accept it. And we need to seek for the help. That's where we have a savior to save us from the flesh. That is Jesus in the spirit. He saves us. And uh, that does not mean that we take uh, our hands off and we say we don't have any responsibility as such. We do have responsibility. We constantly fight this fight. We will be having this. Uh, and what is our, our duty? That is looking unto Jesus, who is the author and perfecter of our faith. So yes. constantly it is a struggle within us to look unto Jesus. The moment we take our eyes off Jesus, either we will become legalistic or we become so nominal. So our constant struggle is to focus and looking unto Jesus. And another point I wanted to bring is something Shanti mentioned also, finding some uh, people where we can be uh, voluntarily, we ourselves can go and be accountable in a very, in a healthy atmosphere. We need to, the, the, we cannot be simply go and talk to everyone and if he's aged or whatever, uh, age old Christian, that does not going to help us. We need to find a healthy atmosphere where we, we be accountable. If that healthy atmosphere is not there, so it is going to backfire us. So we should be careful about that. Finding accountability is one of the uh, best solutions we can find, but both the person who is giving account and who uh, who, speak, uh, who judges it should be on the same page about this. So primary thing is it's a lifetime process struggle we have. <coughs> the solution for this is <coughs> not what, not how, but who. Right. Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Right. Thank you, Praveen. Yes, uh, I uh, just, uh, uh, I mean, it reiterates that point, the relational angle. Right. Finally, uh, it is uh, the, 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 all our activities must be Christ centered, you know, Christocentric, like we say. And without Christ, of course, we have uh, absolutely no, uh, you know, uh, no hope. So, yeah, thanks for those thoughts. Let me quickly go to that second thought. I'll just leave it. I don't know if we have uh, too much time to discuss it, but uh, I just wanted to leave it with you. And the second question is, do we allow Jesus' life story be a model for us? We, uh, I, I touched upon that. And I just want to read you this quotation from uh, Dallas Willard in, uh, he, in his book, The Spirit of the Disciplines. Uh, he says, we can become like Christ by doing one thing, by following him in the overall style of life he chose for himself. If we have faith in Christ, we must believe that he knew how to live. We can, through faith and grace, become like Christ by practicing the types of activities he engaged in, by arranging our whole lives around the activities he himself practiced in order to remain constantly at home in the fellowship of his father. The spirit of the disciplines is nothing but the love of Jesus 
with its resolute will to be like him whom we love. Hope that uh, helps a little bit. So uh, the question, do we allow Jesus' life story to be a model for us? And obviously the answer is yes, but then we do it like uh, uh, we have said, uh, you know, Christ-centered, uh, focusing on Christ. And of course, the uh, uh, recognizing the intention with which we are doing. Okay. Any, any final thoughts or, or, uh, or any uh, thoughts you'd like to share? I think, uh, Sachin, go ahead. Yes. One quick thing on the, the, the last one. I think the relatable God giving us relatable spiritual discipline will not leave us on our humanly attitude to become relatable. So don't worry. <laughs> what I'm saying is this battle, I mean, now we blame people about being legalistic. We are the biggest legalistic, which we don't know sometimes. But what I'm saying is the best thing, at least my personal experience is the Holy Spirit will convict us of the either way. And the moment we falter off is where the small voice in us telling something is somewhere wrong. And I think that's because he will not leave us on our own self to become relatable. It is impossible for us to be relatable. Yeah. He has to present in us to have that relationship. So what I'm saying is the Holy Spirit will play the role to, to convict us, to keep us at guard. It is up to us to, to align, to remain so that we can hear. And of course, then the ecosystem plays a role in supporting us in, in doing that. Okay. Yes, definitely. Thank you, uh, Sachin. Yes, very, very true. I mean, uh, the role of the Holy Spirit there to guide us, lead us uh, is vital and, uh, uh, and gives us that Christ focus. Right. Excellent. Uh, any other final thoughts as we have just a minute or two left for our scheduled time? Mm -hmm. Imitating Jesus is uh, definitely one of the uh, basic best things and great things that we Christians have, we do it. Uh, but for the question, um, basically the question, should we take the life of Jesus as a model for our lives? Uh, the answer is both yes and no. Yeah. Yes is uh, definitely that we want to live like Jesus. Uh, that is there. The no, no part of it is uh, we are not able to live like Jesus. That's why Jesus yeah. came. Yeah. And uh, that's that's one. And second thing is, uh, you know about this famous uh, statement, WWJD, shop on, what would Jesus do? Would Jesus. <laughs> Every time asking this person, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? Uh, that is going to put us back into, again, this legalistic track. Uh, yeah. That is not that Jesus did not call us, and God did not call us to live uh, uh, in, uh, in this setup of uh, things as such, but God uh, called us to live miraculously where his life he is going to manifest in and through us uh, as the Holy Spirit works in us. Our duty is keeping our eyes and minds, hearts open to what he is doing. As Philippians 1 6 says, he who started a good work in us will also bring it uh, to the completion. So uh, it is better for us to focus more on uh, what Jesus has accomplished through his cross which enables us to do uh, to act like jesus rather than if we're just taking the life of jesus as a model and if we try to practice everything that jesus tried jesus did we are going to end up uh, in a very bad shape and situation uh, he died on the cross <laughs> It's unfortunate. Uh, even today, the, there are hundreds of people who are practicing the same thing. They crucify themselves. And all. So uh, we, we, uh, it is not that we have to follow everything that Jesus did and what would Jesus do, but uh, uh, we should let Jesus work in us, focusing more on what he has accomplished for us. Absolutely, yes. Instead of asking what did, what would Jesus <laughs> do, we should say what did Jesus, what did Jesus, you know, what what, what he did. <laughs> what he has already done. Yes, what he has already done. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, I hope that... Uh, yeah. Yes, Vanessa, go ahead. You had a thought. Uh, okay. Uh, in the Old Testament, uh, <laughs> people used to offer sacrifices uh, for forgiveness, offer sacrifices for thankfulness. So many sacrifices were being offered in the Old Testament. 
but in the new testament when jesus came and he bought the new covenant then sacrifices had stopped you don't find uh, written in the bible about the sacrifice of killing killing the rams and all those things but people people i'm talking about people now in our uh, world in our generation uh, when when they uh, want something uh, when they ask for something they are still making promises they are uh, still uh, offering things like uh, they go to like velankani or they go to places and they said we'll offer you this and we'll offer you that we need this we need that so that is also a sacrifice that is being made it's not a live sacrifice of an animal but but still it is a sacrifice being offered so what is the difference between the old testament where the live sacrifice and now where people are also making so god god gave it that time to them when they were giving the sacrifice and god is giving now also so i mean should all all of you have to make a sacrifice or offer something to get something or even some of us without giving something we are still getting so is it is it necessary or is it not necessary okay yes uh, uh berty you wanted to answer that question uh, or did you want to add to the question uh, you need you are unmuted uh, you are muted uh, berty yes i i just wanted to allude to uh, the some scriptures where it says our sacrifices now you know a spiritual where we offer spiritual sacrifices of praise of joy of thanksgiving and uh, maybe you may need to tell vanessa about these aspects and uh, you know uh, uh, that uh, you know how important the spiritual uh, spiritual this spiritual aspect is of uh, offering spiritual sacrifices of praise joy and thanksgiving um, okay. and maybe you may like you may like to add to it well i i just wanted to say i mean it's that's that is a big huge subject obviously we won't be able to deal with it uh, in the little time we have but i just wanted to say the sacrifices under the old covenant were actually uh forward looking they were actually looking to the perfect sacrifice that would come in the future and that we know is jesus christ and so the old testament or old covenant sacrifices were a type of the uh, real sacrifice the uh, final sacrifice that uh, christ would do for us right uh, in terms of now we need to realize that what bertie was talking about sacrifice of praise is done not as to manipulate god you know i mean uh, what people are trying to do is trying to manipulate god by by saying that okay i will donate you know so much of money if you fulfill this for me or i you know they will make a vow to go to velankani like you said <laughs> uh or go on a pilgrimage uh, you know that kind of mindset is not what i think what bertie was alluding to that is a reaction to who god is and the sacrifice he has done for us and so we give our we give our praise as a sacrifice because it's a response to the sacrifice of our lord and savior jesus christ does that help you uh, vanessa the old covenant one was forward looking it was looking to uh, christ as the uh, the real final sacrifice and our sacrifices today in terms of praise and worship and all of that is more in terms of a response to the sacrifice that god gives to us right. does it help you yeah. Yeah. Uh, the main thing is uh, let us let us be very careful that we don't try to manipulate god uh, you cannot manipulate god to you know uh, to get your uh, job done for you right. <laughs> any any uh, thoughts on that you'd like Uh, if you want to have a perspective about old testament sacrifices i will uh, share a link with you uh, that's one of our sermons um, related to sacrifices i guess that would be helpful to you yeah. guys, uh, especially how we should be looking at old testament sacrifices and the sacrifice of jesus right that also there are i guess there are uh, three or four sermons related to that 
I'll share those links with you. Good. That'll be helpful. Yes. Okay. As uh, always, time just fleets. Uh, you know when we get into these discussions. But next time, I'm hoping that we can uh, look at prayer, and if we have time, we will look at silence and solitude. Uh, so depending on you know how much uh, we can cover. Uh, we are focused on how these spiritual disciplines help us for in spiritual maturity and spiritual growth. That will be our focus. All right. So uh, yes, Bertie, Bertie, go ahead. Um, Mr. Zakaria, I think you uh, it would be helpful to all of us if something uh, if we take up a session on accountability, uh, as uh, uh, Shanti mentioned, as uh, Praveen mentioned you would agree that uh, uh, that we have, uh, God says that being free from sin, now we are slaves to God or slaves to righteousness. And there is a accountability, you know, when we say we are a Christian and a follower without uh, being too, you know, legalistic or being too nominal, uh, a type of accountability would really help us to, you know, to, okay. to reflect on ourselves. Yeah. Uh, I, I presume we can take that up under when we talk about stewardship, perhaps, uh, maybe, yes, yes. Yeah, maybe that will sort of fit in well with the subject of stewardship. We can bring in the concept of accountability also. Right. Yeah. Yes, you're right. Okay, with that, uh, don't want to keep you waiting. Uh, maybe Bertie, since uh, you spoke last, we can also close in prayer. Thank you. Yeah, let's bow our heads. Father God, we just, are so happy and thankful lord that you are god and we are your people you are our father we are your children and we are the work of your hands father we thank you for these bible studies lord we thank you for mr zachariah praveen and all the others who give the inputs lord and teach us uh, and guide us lord uh, uh, in our faith lord in our in the truth and lord that we uh, that uh, we a uh, lord are uh, we are indeed lord uh, you indeed, Lord, uh, would want us to be growing, Lord, trusting and, and focusing on Jesus Christ, who is the author of our salvation. Thank you, Lord, for these Bible studies that really enrich us, Lord, and, and help us, Lord, our informative, our, our, Lord, our helpful, Lord, in our, in our Christian pilgrimage here on earth. So we uh, do bless your people who have attended, Lord, and those who are not um, have not been able to attend. But help us, Lord, uh, to keep our eyes focused on you. Uh, Lord, it's very important, Lord, that our eyes on you, Lord, that we wait on you, that we call upon you, Lord, and that we put you first in our lives. Thank you for this time together and bless your people, Father. Thank you. And help us to be uh, regularly attending, Lord, so that we are benefited from uh, these sessions, from this Bible study. Thank you for your servant, Ms. Zachariah, Lord, who leads us so honorably. Thank you, Father. Bless him and his family and all the others as well. We pray this prayer, Father, in Jesus Christ's holy and blessed name. Amen.